Hello, my name is Jim Salas. I'm a professor emeritus in family medicine and public health at UCSD. And I'm going to bring you a lecture today titled Physical Activity, Immunity, Inflammation, and COVID-19. Uh, a little introduction to me maybe would be helpful. I am a psychologist by training. Um, so uh, I'm going to be talking about some biological um, factors today that I don't have uh, deep experience in. But I think I have uh, very relevant um, information uh, for you today. Um, uh, so sorry we can't be together, but that's the nature of the times that we live in. Uh, so let me let me get going here. Um, so uh, this um, uh, first slide shows a couple of things. One, people being active in normal times, and you can see here that the social distancing is not that bad um, uh, if if this were happening today. And on the right is really a, a model of um, uh, physical activity and its impact on the immune and inflammatory systems, which is what this is mainly going to be about. But uh, let me just give you the outline, starting with the main message. Physical activity is a powerful health enhancer based on thousands and thousands of studies that may help with the coronavirus pandemic in several ways. I'm gonna start out with a a little overview of physical activity, showing how physical inactivity is a global health threat. Excuse me just a second. Um, then I'll just show you briefly how in the US and many other countries, uh, there are persistently low levels of physical activity throughout the age range. Um, uh, and then this will be, I'm sure, a, a brief review for you, but I just want to set the stage by uh, uh, explaining how immune function and inflammation are key processes of response to uh, this uh, coronavirus infection. And the, the main message I want to get across is there are four mechanisms that uh, I've come up with by which physical activity can contribute to easing the impact of the pandemic. And I will show you uh, some uh, brief evidence and reviews uh, uh, about each of these. I'm gonna end with some resources um, from CDC and uh, a, a group called Exercises Medicine. And then I have some requests at the end. So we'll start out with the basics. Physical activity is good for you. Uh, everybody knows this. Uh, Really everybody just about in the US knows this in general. Um, but most people don't know the specifics, including this uh, evidence from the World Health Organization that physical inactivity is the fourth leading underlying cause of death um, uh, in the world. And uh, you can see from the, the bar here that most of the deaths attributable to physical inactivity are in middle and low income countries. Um, and that shows two things. One is most people are in low and middle income countries and that the forces leading to uh, inactive lifestyles are not confined to the affluent countries. This is a global situation. The, the physical Physical inactivity has been called a global pandemic. Okay, um, and so how does physical inactivity kill people? And here are some of just the big ones. Uh, coronary heart disease, type two diabetes, breast cancer, colon cancer, and uh, these and other uh, causes of death or mechanisms or diseases add up to about 9% of premature mortality. And so this uh, adds up to uh, well over 5 million deaths per year worldwide that could be eliminated, that could be avoided by eliminating activity. 
Um, there's a, a, a re somewhat recent report um, that estimates that uh, 9 to 11 percent of youth, youth, U.S. healthcare expenditures are due to adults not meeting the guidelines of 150 minutes per week of physical activity. That's an enormous impact. All right, so this is just setting the stage that uh, physical activity is really important. But uh, these, these um, uh, health benefits here are only the tip of the iceberg. Um, in, the, uh, in, 19, in 2018, the revision update of the US physical activity guidelines identified health benefits of physical activity um, and updated the literature on these. And um, I'm, I'm just showing you there, there are quite a few here for children and adolescents and a very, very long list for uh, adults and older adults starting with lower risk of all cause mortality. And I'm not gonna go through all of these. I'm gonna show you an easier to read version of this, a condensed version from uh, the UK that came out with their physical activity guidelines in 2019. So you can, you can see here, it's a little bit easier and shorter, um, but bone health, cognitive function, cardiovascular fitness, uh, weight status and depression for children and so many things um, for adults. And, uh, um, and then for older adults, falls, frailty, and physical function in addition to all the benefits for younger adults. And hidden in the uh, adult list is one that uh, is, is surprising to a lot of people, eight cancers. And so the, uh, uh, the literature on physical activity and cancer is growing rapidly um, and in their review for this uh, guidelines uh, revision they uh, they base their conclusions about which cancers are related uh, on 45 meta-analyses and reviews and so let's just look at the, the evidence here for uh, physical activity protection there's strong evidence for bladder breast colon endometrium, uh, esophagus, renal, and gastric cancer. So that's a very broad range. Uh, moderate um, uh, evidence for lung, uh, lung cancers, uh, no evidence uh, for thyroid and rectal. Um, so that's, that's just something to, to file away and keep in mind. Um, and so let's uh, finish this overview or uh, uh, move on with this overview uh, by looking at what are the recommendations, what are the guidelines for physical activity. So on the left are the guidelines for adults, um, uh, at least 150 minutes per week of moderate intensity uh, activity, aerobic activity like, as you see here, uh, biking, swimming, walking, uh, wheeling, um, and uh, this can be done all at once, but it, it probably is better uh, to break it up throughout the, uh, throughout the week, um, which uh, some evidence that I will uh, go over uh, today um, will illustrate that. And then at least two days a week of muscle strengthening activities. And the uh, asterisk there is, um, uh, if you want to do some of your activity vigorous and some moderate, that's uh, very uh, good. Um, a, a mixture of that would be great. And the main thing is do something. The more, uh, you know, even doing a little is better than doing nothing. Well, what are the guidelines for youth? Um, uh, a bit different, uh, 60 minutes per day of moderate to vigorous physical activity. Um, uh, several days a week of muscle strengthening activity and several days per week of weight bearing activity uh, to build uh, strong bones that will last a long uh, a lifetime. All right, so how are we doing in meeting guidelines here in the US? Um, well, as you can see here, um, men are doing a little bit better than women, um, but they're both hovering they're in the 15 to 25% range. 
And uh, I would say there's an extremely small, uh, um, low slope of increase. So it's basically been static um, since these data in 2008. So uh, not much uh, evidence of increase. What about adolescents? Well, you can see there's a bigger gap between boys and girls, um, which is uh, unfortunate and it's something that we need to, uh, indicating we need to uh, help girls more in getting active. But the, the rates of meeting the guidelines of, phys of aerobic and muscle strengthening are really low. Uh, uh, generously, 13, 15 to uh, 30 percent. Um, so the vast majority of adults and adolescents in this country are not meeting guidelines. How do we stack up internationally? Not that good. Um, uh, you can see that we're on the, the lower end for, uh, uh, this is uh, a prevalence of inactivity, so it's a little more um, uh, a little more difficult to uh, uh, to uh, interpret, and it's it's different uh, 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 metrics from uh, what I just showed for uh, U.S. So this is inactivity just with aerobic. So um, about seventy percent, according to this, would meet. Uh, the guidelines for aerobic activity, um, but uh, but maybe that's not stringent enough. Um, so anyway, uh, um, it, it, the whole world has a problem with inactivity. Basically, what that shows. So now let's let's transition to you know how physical activity uh, uh, could be probably is. Um, relevant to the coronavirus. Uh, this is just something uh, I found in uh, a, a visual in USA Today um, showing the, uh, the key issues here. So uh, this is what happens, uh, this, is, this, this is pneumonia, but uh, uh, similar for uh, virus, uh, other virus in infections. And uh, basically, the, the virus attaches itself to lung uh, tissue and starts replicating. So the, uh, this, re this, um, uh, this attachment attracts uh, immune cells, uh, which see it as a, a foreign invader, and they start attacking and trying to kill the virus. Well, this battle between the virus and the immune cells um, creates inflammation in uh, the al alveolar walls. And so uh, this airspace gets filled with fluid, so there's, uh, there's less exchange of, uh, of gases, less space for that to happen, less uh, tissue um, contact with gases. Um, so this is what uh, causes the problems with breathe breathing and why if the infection is not well controlled by the um, immune system and uh, there's excessive inflammation, then breathing breaks down. So, so the two, the basic reason I'm uh, mentioning this is that the two key processes here are the uh, immune uh, function and inflammation. Um, and so based on this, uh, I've come up with uh, how physical activity may contribute to controlling the pandemic in four ways. So first, moderate physical activity enhances immune function and reduces inflammation. So it could reduce the severity of infections. So this is a, a direct um, potential uh, impact of physical activity on reducing severity of infections. The second uh, benefit, moderate physical activity uh, has great evidence of improving the common chronic conditions that increase risk for severe COVID-19, like cardiovascular disease, like diabetes, like um, 
uh, cancers. Third uh, pathway, moderate physical activity is one of the best stress management methods. So um, uh, it's obvious now that uh, basically throughout the whole world, uh, millions, billions of people are under stress uh, from fear of this pandemic. And it's in virtually every country now, uh, and uh, people's lives are getting disrupted. Um, it's just obvious that this is a time of high stress. Well, uh, moderate activity uh, can prevent symptoms of anxiety and depression, help people cope with that anxiety and depression. For people who already have uh, some level of anxiety, depression, um, physical activity is, I'm gonna emphasize, as effective a treatment as medication and psychotherapy. You don't see that talked about very much, but the, that's what the evidence shows uh, uh, and has for years. Um, so helping people uh, maintain the qual quality of life, reduce their stress during the pandemic uh, is a public health benefit, whether physical activity uh, benefited the, the uh, infection at all. Okay, there's one more. Uh, and it connects the mental and the physical. Um, stress and distress cause imbalances of cortisol um, that negatively affect immune function and inflammation. Um, and so, uh, so stress itself um, contributes to risk of, uh, of poor control of the infection. So reducing risk um, which physical activity, reducing cortisol and stress, which physical activity uh, does, is another mechanism by which um, physical activity can uh, uh, reduce the severity of the, of the infection. So um, let's, let's move on. So that's basically what we're gonna be talking about here. And maybe in not such a linear way as this, because uh, some of these things are um, uh, interrelated. Okay, so um, I, I thought this was uh, useful. I'm not gonna go into it um, in detail, but it shows that people who are active, um, uh, the arrow to the left shows that uh, exercise mobilizes cytotoxic immune cells. And this, this um, a graphic was produced from the point of view of cancer, um, but it, this uh, I want to generalize this to um, exercise stimulating immune function. On the left, on the right, um, it exercise tempers inflammatory signaling through several mechanisms. Uh, physical activity can reduce um, in, in, uh, inflammatory responses, and then the third. Um, is that uh, exercise regulates systemic inflammation. And uh, what you see here is for, the, um, for each of the, the people being active, there's a burst of exercise-induced um, anti-inflammatory uh, uh, chemicals um, in an acute phase. And then uh, the purple line that uh, slowly declines uh, shows that uh, over, uh, over time, the general inflammation uh, levels are, are reduced. Um, so this is kind of a, a summary of uh, the immune and inflammatory impacts of physical activity. Uh, again, uh, I, I put together this lecture originally for uh, a cancer conference, so that's why a lot of my examples are from cancer. Um, but you'll see some uh, evidence specific to uh, uh, virus infections toward the end. Um, so here's an important one, a quote, although many cell types produce plasma cytokines, uh, muscle cells are a major source during exercise. Um, and uh, regular muscle contraction can mediate signals with myokines that suppress pro-inflammatory activities at both distant sites, hopefully including the lungs, and within the skeletal muscle itself. So um, 
So the, the, when muscle con, our muscles are contracting, they produce anti-inflammatory compounds. Um, and here's multiple mechanisms by which physical activity may lower inflammation, decreasing M1 macrophages in visceral adipose tissue, decreasing adipose tissue volume altogether, uh, production of anti-inflammatory myokines, uh, product, promotion of butyrate, producing members of the gut microbiota, uh, improved gut barrier function, and lowering of postprandial glycemic and lipidemic responses. Um, and so these both lower inflammation and help other, uh, other issues like, uh, let's say, diabetes. Um, uh, what about immune function? How can exercise uh, help with that? It acutely mobilizes lymphocytes in the circulation. Um, the sheer stress of uh, increased blood movement during exercise increases catecholamine levels, leading to more immune cells. It stimulates uh, production of immune cells. The most affected immune cells are natural killer cells, T cells, and macrophages. And these cells survey the body for transformed cells as immunological targets. That's their um, uh, uh, relation to um, irrelevance for, for cancer. Um, and so, uh, and also it releases these immune regulatory cytokines, um, interleukin uh, of various uh, types. Um, uh, let's see, what did I want to say here? Ah, uh, yes, okay, here's, here's the, uh, um, uh, in inflammation signaling. Exercise regulates circulating monocytes acutely and with long-term training, but uh, it's thought that a, acute vigorous exercise dampens in immunological responsivity to cellular damage. So you'll see this um, a few times uh, during the during the presentation that there are uh, there's concern about vigorous exercise and, and whether that may not be helpful to dealing with infections and inflammation. Okay, so the regulation of systemic low-grade inflammation. So the key thing here is that uh, over time, longer-term exercise produces modest reductions in things like uh, interleukin-6, but the acute effects on these biomarkers are much stronger. So um, let's file that away because that suggests that you need to do activity regularly, like taking a medication. It doesn't last forever. Okay, um, uh, I basically just said this. This again emphasizes the, uh, the second part here, the acute exercise effects on biomarkers, up to uh, tenfold differences. Um, so we won't, we won't go over that. Um, uh, and here's just a, an example of a large uh, study of healthy men, uh, over 7,000 healthy men in the health professional study, um, and they're comparing um, uh, these biomarkers for, uh, across the, the highest and lowest physical activity groups. And you see these quite large differences for C-reactive protein and uh, interleukin-6. And the relation was uh, linear. So the more activity, um, uh, the, the, the better the uh, uh, inflammatory markers were. Um, if you adjusted for adiposity, there was modest attenuation, but uh, physical activity had, uh, was still associated even independently of adiposity. Uh, this is an interesting one, stronger association for the combination of aerobic and resistance exercise. So that's uh, a recommendation that could be made to people. And it, it didn't matter if people were obese or not, or if they had healthy diets or not, those did not modify the association. So in overweight people, um, extra, uh, physical activity was related to better uh, uh, in, inflammatory 
functioning, and the, the same with uh, uh, lean people. So uh, that shows that this is a, a, a robust uh, connection here. Um, okay, now this one, uh, this one is really important because this, uh, uh, this, is, this was a review uh, specifically of uh, upper of, of physical activity and upper respiratory tract uh, infections. And, um, and the key here is that multiple types of evidence um, is shown that physical activity reduces the incidence and severity of upper respiratory tract infections. Obviously not uh, COVID-19, um, but let's, let's just look. So if we, let me see if my pointer works. Uh, no, not very well. Um, so up towards the top, Animal investigation showed that brief bouts of moderate physical activity um, uh, compared to inactivity prior to or immediately following inoculation with pathogens led to decreased mortality and morbidity from infection. So that's with animal studies. Early exercise training studies of high risk groups, older and obese uh, humans, um, demonstrated 12 to 15 weeks of exercise related, resulted in lower incidence or duration of upper, upper respiratory tract infections uh, compared to sedentary individuals. And these effects were uh, supported by longitudinal studies of, of the general population, 18 to 85 years old, where maintenance of a moderately active lifestyle led to lower, uh, lower uh, respiratory tract infections. Let me see if I can move this. Yeah. Uh, episodes, okay. So there's a direct impact of exercise on reducing um, respiratory tract infections, episodes and severity. Okay, uh, this is, um, uh, a, an illustration of what's thought to be happening with infection risk and intensity of activity. Um, and that is that uh, the, the uh, immune function is at its best um, with moderate intensity physical activity and infection risk is at its lowest with, um, uh, with moderate activity. And so you can see those are both in both of those outcomes, it's better than, uh, than being sedentary or having very low activity levels. But at higher levels of activity, um, there's, there's some evidence that uh, immune function gets worse and infection risk goes higher. So that's why we're gonna be talking about moderate physical activity, the most common by far moderate activity is just walking which is something everybody, just about everybody can do at some level. Okay, now let's, let's go to the, uh, the cortisol uh, issue. And I, I found a, uh, a recent uh, meta-analysis and review, and I'm not gonna get into diurnal cortisol slopes, but um, I'm, I'm just gonna label that as cortisol dysregulation because it's related to other uh, cortisol indicators. So this review found cortisol dysregulation was related to multiple diseases, including cancer and obesity, as well as mental health conditions such as depression and fatigue. But the strongest associations of cortisol of any of the outcomes was with immunity and inflammation. So again, going back to the key processes of the coronavirus. And uh, this uh, this, the uh, conclusion in here is the recommended strategies from the literature for restoring balance to cortisol are physical activity and stress management. So um, again, to, they're gonna help mental health and uh, this is another mechanism by which physical activity uh, can improve immunity and in inflammation by reducing, uh, by reducing, cortisol. Okay, 
So now we're uh, getting close to the end and I want to uh, emphasize some conclusions. Uh, my little way of expressing this is active muscles are factories of compounds that improve immune function and reduce inflammation, both of those. The strongest effects are acute, but there seem to be chronic improvements as well. Mo we just saw moderate physical activity reduces the incidence and severity of viral upper respiratory tract infections making this very promising um, for application uh, to COVID-19. Because muscles are 30 to 40% of body mass, the potential impact of physical activity, which is muscular movement on COVID-19 um, could be substantial, but needs to be studied. We do need some studies. Older people and those with underlying chronic conditions are at higher risk of severe COVID-19, are more likely to be inactive, have less effective immune systems, so they would probably benefit the most from becoming moderately active. And I, I will just say it's controversial whether extreme activity like marathons or even vigorous activity like running depress immune function and raise the risk of upper respiratory track infections. But um, for public health and for most patients you would deal with, um, vigorous is irrelevant because very few people do it. So moderate physical activity should be the goal and the focus. All right, um, uh, another set of conclusions. Um, regular vigorous activity can relieve some of the stress of people facing the ep epidemic and uh, I think there's reason to believe that physical activity will be of value in promoting a more effective immunological response and a less damaging inflammatory response to the con uh, coronavirus infection. Um, the strong effects, acute effects of uh, activity suggest people should be active before and after the infection so that, uh, uh, that moderate activity can help them deal with uh, the infection itself. Physical activity should not be an afterthought during this pandemic. Being active should be a key recommendation. There's plenty of evidence in support of that. Um, physical activity is already widely recommended. What's missing is a concerted effort to implement some of the many evidence-based intervention strategies. So if we were to get serious about um, getting, uh, helping people be more active during this pandemic, uh, there's a lot more that we need to do than we are doing now. While we con conduct studies of the effects of physical activity on COVID-19, which we should do, we should also be recommending moderate uh, activity before and after the infection, and I would say that physical activity leaders are now advocating for education and encouragement of physical activity as a key component in confronting the pandemic. And uh, uh, I will uh, say that um, we can be pretty certain that the side effects of any increases in physical activity that would come as a result of this would generally be improved mental and physical health on many dimensions. Okay, so um, now hopefully you're uh, interested in doing something about this uh, um, and helping patients uh, become more active. So let me um, point you to a few resources. So uh, a few things, are, I think we're gonna see much more online. I just keep hearing more and more about online resources to help people be active, especially indoors during the pandemic. So I, I've seen a, this uh, article in the Atlantic, which may or may not be helpful, um, but uh, we will see. Uh, but it's, it's uh, one of many. And I think a lot of people who are sheltering in place are working out and then putting their uh, workouts uh, videos online for other people uh, to benefit from. Um, and this is a, a slight conflict of interest because Spark Physical Education 
is something that I help, uh, basically helped start and then still a part of. Um, but what I'm uh, 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 suggesting here is they have home physical education, uh, phys physical education units for all age groups. And all of those materials are free um, from the, uh, the Spark website. And out, I am very pleased that outdoor physical activity is being widely encouraged um, by the governor of California who said, go out and take, it, take it, uh, your dog for a walk, take your kids to the park. Um, uh, the uh, governor of New York um, uh, uh, suspended fees for state parks. Um, but as we have seen, when people are being active outdoors, they're not necessarily uh, practicing social distancing. So that's essential to do, and it can be done. I was on the uh, Mission Beach boardwalk this weekend, and I saw what I felt was very good uh, adherence to social distancing with hundreds, thousands of people uh, being active um, uh, on the boardwalk and on the beach and are able to um, uh, keep distance uh, from others. So let's advocate for keeping beaches, parks, and trails open, um, but uh, enforcing uh, social distancing while people are being active there. Okay, um, here's something a little more specific to you. Uh, Exercisesmedicine.org. It is a, uh, uh, a unit uh, or a program initiative of the American College of Sports Medicine. And uh, I was pleased to see that they have materials. Um, here's a flyer about staying active during the coronavirus uh, pandemic. So, uh, uh, and this is uh, uh, just in the past week, uh, they, they put this up. Um, so let, let me uh, go here to, uh, they have frequently asked questions and um and some some very nice things like what if my kids are home with me being active with kids is the most fun of all find activities that you can do together uh, including going for a walk in your neighborhood and what about uh the uh and of course i i don't want to uh minimize uh the, the most important thing right now is the top of the second column um, uh, how can the most important thing we can do right now is to prevent infection by, and to avoid coming in contact with others who are infected. But of course, we don't know who is affected, so uh, we have to assume that everybody might be effect, infected. Um, so that is extremely important. Uh, but I, I want to call your attention to the final uh, question here. I'm under quarantine and infected. Should I limit my uh, activity? Um, and it says people who are infected but without symptoms can continue moderate physical activity um, but need to use symptoms or, uh, as, as a guide. Um, and if you develop fever, cough, or shortness of breath, uh, they recommend stopping physical activity and reaching out to your uh, health care provider. So um, I say, so as long as you can be active uh, after uh, you're infected, um, very likely the better off you will be because your activity will help you fight the virus. Um, uh, another a set of uh, materials is from the, the CDC uh, called Help Active People Healthy Nation. And there are lots of uh, materials um, there for all kinds of people. Um, so uh, I have the link there. So hopefully you'll be able to access these slides uh, afterwards so you can use that. And if you're interested in international work, um, the World Health Organization has a relatively new physical activity promotion initiative called um, uh, More Active People for a Healthier World. And, um, and it's about uh, these, these four things, creating healthier societies, creating uh, active people so that people are making good decisions, 
creating active environments so that there are easy places and, and safe and attractive places to be active and creating active systems so that we encourage um, and incentivize people to be active. So uh, you can look that up, the, the uh, Global Action Plan for Physical Activity from WHO. And so the final thing uh, is uh, my request. Uh, and uh, uh, it, it is quite possible, this is the only lecture in medical school that you will get about physical activity. I hope that's not true, uh, but it may be. So I would like to encourage you to put this on your own personal to-do list to learn more about physical activity so you can uh, incorporate it into your research practice and advocacy. Um, I encourage you to check out some of the resources in this presentation. And uh, also, uh, you need to take care of yourselves. So I encourage you to continue to be active yourselves. And one note of caution about that, um, in the late 1980s, I was part of a study um, uh, where we uh, surveyed medical students in their first week and in their fourth year uh, about a wide variety of health topics. And we found that during medical school, students became less active, more stressed, had less healthy diets, and got less sleep, among other negative effects. And you can probably relate to that. And that's only going to be more difficult now uh, under this, uh, uh, the stress of the pandemic. So you're going to need to rely on yourself and your good decisions and your good habits to help resist that trend. And if you're interested in physical activity more generally, I have a lot of um, uh, resources on my website. So I am going to uh, uh, end my lecture there. And I'm sorry that we can't interact. Uh, and um, so... Uh, that is the end of this lecture. So uh, best wishes and stay healthy.